My name is Wolf Gruner. I'm the uh, director of the UC Shaw Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research, and I uh, thank you all for coming. And it is my um, distinct pleasure to introduce you to Julia Werner, or Julia Werner, <laughs> how you pronounce it in German. Uh, she came straight from Berlin, uh, being selected as the this year's um, uh, Margie and Douglas uh, Greenberg uh, Research Fellow. Uh, she is a PhD candidate from Berlin. And by the way, we are, it's our pleasure to have Margie and uh, Douglas Greenberg here. So uh, she came straight from Berlin. She is a PhD candidate at the Humboldt University, where she is working on her PhD uh, on photography. But she will talk about this more in detail. But she is part of a bigger project on photography uh, uh, doing National Socialism, uh, which is um, uh, run by one of the most eminent uh, Holocaust scholars uh, in Germany, uh, Michael Wild. And uh, she, is, um, uh, she has also uh, done already research with uh, uh, at the Department of History at the Humboldt University and also at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. Uh, and as many German scholars very early on do, she is already published. Uh, so she has already uh, published a book, uh, co-edited with uh, another uh, very distinguished German uh, scholar on uh, the Holocaust, Christoph Kreuzmüller. And they both focus on um, <coughs> photog let's say photographies as sources during National Socialism. Uh, and uh, more specifically, during the Holocaust in Europe. So this is kind of an introduction to, the, uh, to, to photographies as sources. Uh, and it's part of this kind of uh, iconic turn in Holocaust studies um, during the last 10 years. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome and give her a hand. OK, so thank you for the introduction. So this lecture is now, basically it marks the end of my two, two and a half weeks stay here as a Greenberg Fellow, but it's definitely, for me, only the beginning of working um, more with the testimony. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to start with that here. So the, uh, my uh, talk was announced as Beyond the Pictorial Frame, the Ghettoization of Jews in Poland. So what I'm going to talk about is the actual moment of ghettoization and the forced move of the Jewish population in Poland from their homes to a designated ghetto area. I'm going to start and I'm first of all going to talk about my photographical sources and then in the second step um, I'm going to talk about how and why I've attempted to combine the photos with uh, the testimonies from the Visual History Archive. Um, yeah, Wolf well, already said that my uh, PhD is part of a bigger um, research project, Photography During National Socialism at Humboldt University. And maybe just very briefly, like the project is mainly um, looking into private, non-professional amateur photography as a historical source. Like there has been quite a bit of research on propaganda and uh, propaganda iconography. But yeah, we are more focusing on like private uh, photo photographs from like private practice. And my project specifically is looking into occupied Poland. And when I started my research, um, I was more uh, looking for um, fo broadly like for photos from ghettos. But um, in the process of my research, I um, just found a whole lot of photos that just showed like the day of the ghettoization and the actual move. And um, that was something like for me it was surprising because that's something that I didn't know a lot about. I hadn't seen a lot of pictures. And also like in research I hadn't read much about it. Usually um, it's just like one sentence on this day they had one day to move or they had, um, like in the case of uh, Litzmannstadt, they had a couple of days. Um, but usually that's, um, that's about it. And there are some publications that deal with the life in the already established ghettos and kind of look into the, the consequences in the everyday life. 
but I mean, and generally, historical research is more focused also, like especially I think in Germany, like on structural questions and um, questions like the function of the ghettos. And so the photos actually help me kind of to carve out this moment of the ghettoization as an important and central moment. And this, just as an example, in the beginning, is uh, one of the pictures that like one of the first pictures that I came across, and it was taken in uh, Kutno, a small town in western Poland. And this was taken um, like early evening on the day of the ghettoization on June 15, 1940. And as you can see in Kutno, the, the situation was very much different from what we uh, with what we are used to seeing like from the bigger ghettos like Warsaw where it's like against the background of a cityscape and like urban structures. In Kutno, um, uh, the Jews were notified on uh, Saturday and they had to move on Sunday and the area of the ghetto was um, on the area of a former abandoned sugar factory and there were only two intact buildings and the people basically were just were allowed could bring their stuff there it was two kilometers from the city center and then basically they were just left there with with um, the things and like this photo left a very very strong impression on me because because of the this extreme situation and here I mean also it's very hard to describe the structure of this image um, but basically you kind of have to look for scenes I don't know if the quality is good enough so you can kind of detect some details like you can see like people here, you can see still there's still some horse carts, people are about to like unload all their belongings. But that just um, as an example for a photo in the beginning. And that kind of got me thinking about this, this particular moment and why, why it was important and that it was of course important on a level for the cities themselves that it changed like the whole dynamic of the city like in Kutno um, all the apartments that were left behind in the city center were then later given to ethnic Germans that were resettled or also um, to the Polish neighbors and then of course and that's also where later um, the testimonies come in of course it was like a very important um, moment in the individual biographies of the people who had to move to the ghettos. And one of the survivors of the ghetto in Krakow remembers in her memoirs, and she writes, it's in German and I translate it, um, she writes about the day of the ghetto, ghettoization. Um, this would be a painful step. A life full of memories has been collected in this apartment. We loved this apartment very much and we took very good care of it. And this is also the place where the three of us, three siblings were born. But in just one moment, our whole life has to be pack, packed up. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the historical context of the ghettoizations and then um, more about the photographic material. So I already mentioned a little bit that a lot of the research and debates on um, the ghettoization policy are based on or focus very much on um, perpetrator documents and see it like from a perspective of population policy and kind of consider the ghettoization as look at it like as a form of social engineering or like a his, as a part of a history of like competing competing institutions and questions of what the like dominant motives for the ghettos were but very rarely are the actual results of these policies taken into consideration and um, yeah, like what leaving apartment and belongings behind actually meant. And also visually, uh, this moment of transfer has not been a part of the established groups of images that are published again and again in catalogs and exhibitions. Um, there are a few publications on the big and well-known ghettos in Warsaw and Wuch, but um, I, I think I already mentioned that they are <coughs> more focus on the, the life in the already um, established ghettos and there's very 
little on the smaller ghettos and nothing really on the move itself. All in all, um, until now, I have uh, researched 346 <coughs> photos of the ghettoizations from various ghettos, big ghettos and small ghettos in all parts of occupied Poland. And the Germans divided occupied Poland into like different spheres of functions. And so also the ghettos served different functions and were established at different times. Um, but I'm not going to go into this context on detail because I really want to focus on the sources themselves. And I also think that um, even though the ghettoizations were subject to different dynamics for the actual moment and for the visual situations they created and for what I'm going to look into, it's, it's not um, a central element. The photos that I've researched were, in some cases I know, in most of the cases it's very safe to assume, taken by non-professional and amateur photographers. Um, and there has been research on propaganda photography, but this idea of really working with non-professional photography in Germany started like around 20 years ago with an exhibition about the role of the German Wehrmacht in the attack of the Soviet Union, where uh, in the exhibition they used um, a lot of private photography as an illustration, but also um, as a proof to show um, proof of the mm, mass shootings. And um, since then, it um, this idea took off slowly, but I would say it definitely gained some momentum in the last couple of years. The photos that I've researched are mostly um, single photos. And in a lot of cases, I know very little about the photographers. And that's also one of the very big challenges of working with amateur photography that because a lot of along for a long time, it was not considered a valuable source. So the archives, sometimes they took them in or they just took like single photos out of other files and put them separately. So very often there is not a lot of context information av available. And it was kind of assumed that the photos as a window to the past would just speak like for themselves, basically. So yeah, I have 350 photos with different degrees of information. So in my analytical approach to, to deal with these photos, I, I try to carve out the dominant modes of depiction of the ghettoization. So I try to work out patterns of depiction, certain like Mm, aesthetic phrases and to interpret them. So what I did first is like I, I made a distinction between the two photographical situations of waiting and actual movement because there's a big group of photographs where the people actually just took out their belongings and are waiting either to leave or for horse carts and then there are the pictures that actually where the people are actually moving towards the ghetto. And so this picture was also taken in Kutno. This is actually a part of a, a series. And yeah, here you can see a lot of things and belongings. The people have taken them out there sitting in front of the houses, but like the things take up a lot of space or room in the photograph. And you actually have to kind of look for, for the people in between the things. There's the little boy here, and actually he seems to be the only one maybe noticing the camera. There's another little boy here. Then there's two women standing here facing this direction. You can also see that they're wearing um, the star, star, of David. star of David. Yeah. Star of David. Yeah. Then there's another woman sitting here. Another one is here. Then the next example um, is a similar scene, also in Kutno. It's another 
street, this photo has more of a of a structure and it's a little bit clearer and less chaotic than the previous one. Also here you can see that there's a little boy who's looking towards the camera. And other than that, also you really actually have to look for scenes and people. And here you can see another boy with his mother or anything. And the next one in this kind of series is also that gives kind of an overview of the situation, but also here you see a little girl facing the camera, but it does not focus actually on, on the people um, in the pictures or scenes that are happening during the ghettoization. So for the photos that depict the waiting, the dominant type is usually taken from quite a distance and it tries to document and give an overview over the chaotic scene that has unfolded in front of the camera. The people on the pictures are usually not in the focus and they're not depicted as active agents or subjects. And the way in which they handle the situation that they are put in is not part of the majority of the photographic frames. So and only what I did a little bit, only if you really look closer and do like a little bit of detective work, you're able to detect people and what they do. They sit, they carry things, they communicate, or they contemplate. And because of the distance taken on by the majority of the photographers, and because the people are so absorbed by the move, there's very, very little interaction between the cameras and the people being photographed, with an exception of, of the children. Maybe to, to make it a little bit more clear, um, this, this type of photo I'm talking about, I'm going to give you like a picture that's maybe a good contrast that was also taken during the ghettoization, um, on the day of the ghettoization in Kutno. And this is usually a, an image that compared to the other images, people react very, very strongly to. And that's probably also like the type of image that would be chosen for an exhibition or a catalog. Because here, the pho photographer, really, there's interaction between the camera and um, the people. And usually, the mother is really always in the center of um, discussion about this photo. And she is like with, with a scarf and the baby she's holding, she, has, she's, she appears like an, an icon. So the next um, photographic situation would be the, the, the situation of the actual movement. And I'm going to show this one was taken in Krakow. This one here is from Beijing. And this, the, the last one was taken in uh, Łódź. And so what you can see here as a pattern or as a dominant mode of depiction is um, that mostly the people and their belongings moving to the ghetto are depicted from, um, from slightly from the side or from behind. But so that you get kind of an impression that they're like going away, disappearing or vanishing like to different degrees here because here it's a little bit further away from the camera. Mm. So yeah, in comparison to the photographs of the waiting situation, where the people were mostly isolated or in very small groups and somewhat also really disappeared between like the huge amounts of things um, in the photographs of the movement, um, The, um, the, the, the isolated people from, from before are kind of made into one hom homogeneous group moving in one direction. 
So, all in all, um, the photographs make the individuality of the people photographed invisible. And also, what they also make invisible is actually the force and the violence of this, this move. Because on, on the one hand, you, you do not see acts of physical violence, but on the other hand, you also, there are almost in none of the pictures mm, Germans in uniforms. So it kind of seems like it's a process that was set in motion by the people themselves, or at least you cannot see, see anyone who is forcing them to move. And of course, also just the mere act of taking a photo in that situation adds another layer of violence to it. So photography, or the creation of a representation of this situation, um, of this forced move, extends the act of violence basically until, until today. And even though photography was not as common as a practice as it is today, obviously in 1939, around 10% of the German population owned uh, a camera, it is still safe to assume that um, of course, there was an awareness and understanding of the photographic situation and practice on, on both sides of the camera. So what the photos helped me to do was to um, bring out the importance of this moment of the ghettoization, also to open new perspectives. Like I found images that are unusual, that, I, that add, add understanding. Um, like in the case of the Kutno ghetto, but at the same time, as I, I've already said, they make the force and the violence that also happened somewhat invisible. And all in all, they reproduce the perpetrator's perspective and they also dehumanize the people. Of course, the process of the ghettoization does that in the first place, um, but the photos of the ghettoization seen through the eyes of the perpetrators of Germans in uniforms or bystanders who keep a distance and do not focus on, on the people in that situation perpetuates that. So in the process of the ghettoization, the Jewish population was forced into being a group and the photos reinforce that. And that is generally in my project, one of the, the biggest um, problems that a majority of the photos that I have found was taken by Germans, by perpetrators, by non-Jewish bystanders, but there's very, very little material um, taken by, Polish, by the Christian Polish or Jewish Polish population. And so you always have a very pr peculiar perspective namely that of privileged ethnic Germans or Reichs Germans, um, who, who were of course in a completely different um, situation and had very easy access to cameras and roll film and generally the means of production. And the main reason of course why there are almost no photos um, taken by Jewish Poles or Catholic Poles is because the Nazi occupiers tried to control the means of production. And Poles and Jews were not allowed to own cameras. The Germans uh, also um, dispossessed Polish um, photo labs. They banned Polish professional photographers from employment and also confiscated private cameras. And also for the ghettos, it's assumed that there was a general ban on owning photographs, and so generally the Jewish population had very, very little influence on the outcome or like on the photos, on the level of production, <coughs> on the level of the motives, also like in the photographic the situations that they were put in on the other side of the camera, they often had very little influence. And also, of course, um, in the distribution. So only the idea is that only like by going beyond the pictorial frame, it can kind of bring back the the voice or the agencies of of the people who were being photographed. 
and the individuality of the Jewish men, women, and children who are being ghettoized, and actually to be able to see beyond the, the frame of the photo. And in the last two weeks, I've been amazed, but also a little bit overwhelmed by the large number of relevant interviews and segments that I have found. So I have to say it's really a work in progress. And I'm still working on how to really like systematically relate photos and um, testimonies. And for now, for today, I've chosen just a few examples to show or to just give an idea of uh, the value that the testimonies have for my research. And I'm going to start um, with a testimony um, um, from a lodge from Litzmannstadt. And the testim uh, the Roman Bohemel Green, des he describes the ghettoization or the day of the ghettoization as follows. How much, the interviewer asked, how much time were you given to move? We had a week to move. What were you allowed to take? We had no transportation, we did not have a car, so we did not have special horses with wagons to do it. We did it by ourselves. We packed everything in packages, and my father, he was that time home, we built little platforms with little wheels, and then we moved from one place to another. What were you allowed to take with you? From these houses, everything we could. Since this was a poor part of the city, they did not care about our belongings because we didn't have too much. But I know that in other parts of the city, they were given very short notice to go, and the most important things were left at home. Nice furniture or artwork, this was not allowed to be taken. We didn't have it, so we didn't have a problem with taking it, although we didn't take everything because we couldn't. What part of the city was it in? This part of the city was named Baluche, a part of the city which was not a modern part of the city. What happened when you arrived at the ghetto? What was the first thing that happened? First of all, we had to move, and this took a few days. We had to do it little by little, and when we arrived at the ghetto, we got a worse apartment than we'd had before. The whole trip could, take, could have taken 45 minutes by foot. So what I found very interesting about this is that the way he remembers the different ways in which people were treated based on wealth and class affiliation, and depending on which kind of neighborhood they lived in and whether their belongings were of interest. But he also talks about con the conditions of the forced move, that even though in Lodz, at least some of the people from the poorer neighborhoods were given a couple of days to move, they were still left with no help to do so. And it's often in other testimon al testimonies also mentioned that Jews had to pay paid a lot of money um, to the Polish population in order to get help and a horse cart. And or what that also happened, and what he also mentions is that they built like things to help with the transport um, themselves. But most of the time, they had to leave a lot of things behind <coughs> because, of course, they were moving to a much much smaller space. Then a. In another uh, testimony also about um, the Lodge ghetto, <coughs> Moshe Barnea, he describes um, we, about the day of the ghettoization, we got in the building. There was from the administration, they let us know that we had to move out. And then we were trying to sell, and there was not much to sell because there were no buyers. The Polish people, our neighbors, know that we have to leave everything. So why they should buy? They have only to wait to get it. And then the German police arrived with weapons and they moved us out. That was uh, to downtown, the most primitive part of Lodz. So also in this testimony, for me, it was very interesting that here he actually mentions the police uh, with weapons who accompanied them to the ghettos because that is something that we really rarely find in the photographic images. And generally, the the things, the belongings, are always a central subject when the people speak about the day of the move uh, in the tes testimonies. 
Um, but also here it's important to keep in mind, and that's also something they often talk about and that also he talked about, it's that on the day they moved to the ghetto, they a lot of them had already lost or a lot of their belongings, either because they already had moved several times before or because um, they had already <coughs> been taken or stolen by Germans or later the neighbors prior to the ghettoization. But what they always, or what they very often bring out is um, the personal relationships between the people and also their, the things and their belongings that they need to leave behind. And in another testimony from Tarno, um, Alexander Gusha talks about the day. It's in German and I will translate it. And, and then we were allocated an apartment in the ghetto. And there was an episode, I had a canary, and that was my biggest worry, the can canary, uh, during the resettlement. That's the impression that stayed with me. His name was Kubush. That was very typical. Every yellow canary was named Kubush. And my biggest worry was um, to transport my beloved bird. And the ghetto was only still in the process of structuring and there was no space for the new furniture that my parents had bought the year before in Krakow with uh, very precious uh, crystal glasses and whatnot. And all that, my father took it to the factory and in the factory we had a um, shack and there he put all the furniture I remember it very precisely because every time he went with an axe and he destroyed um, a table and all the wonderful furniture. I remember precisely what because he destroyed everything. And Kubush, he died to my biggest regret and I, bought, I built him a little um, yeah. sarg, coffin. coffin. Yeah a little coffin, <coughs> and, um, and I buried him. And then we had to move into a very little house with all our relatives and uh, friends. So on the one hand, um, this testimony brings out um, very well his, his perspective as a child during the move. And I think that also like corresponds or correlates very well with the photos, where you can see that actually the children are the only ones who actually notice that there's a camera and who are not like completely absorbed by all the responsibilities and the worries during um, the move. But the other um, part of the testimony, um, the memory of his father um, who destroys the expensive furniture also left a very big impression on me. I mean, it is very, we don't know what his exact motives were, but it is definitely a very strong choice and also a statement um, that shows how he, in his case, used like the very little sphere of influence and choices that he still had. I already mentioned that there is no physical acts of violence in the photos and also rarely people like Germans in uniforms. But for Kutno, I found one um, testimony where Gordon Klaski talks about the day of the ghettoization. And it, um, yeah. the Germans, they gave the order to the Jewish population that everybody has to report the next day to a certain place. And this was called, it used to be a factory that made sugar, it was called Constantia. And over there that Sunday we were allowed to take whatever we could. What were you allowed to take with? Furniture, whatever, you know. You couldn't take any dogs or cats. So furniture you t could take along with you. And tools, but most things we left. While we were taking our stuff, they used to, the mayor of the city, I remember his name, he was an SA man and his name was Sherman and he was walking through the Jewish homes and he used to beat us. He used to take out everything, you know, and he used to beat us over our heads, fast, fast, you know, schnell. So this testimony actually helps to bring out this 
incident during the ghettoization in Kutno that would otherwise, just through the pictures and other sources, be invisible. And he continues to talk about the day of the ghettoization and then also later of um, the establishment. So that Sunday they took us to that ghetto. It was a big place. And I was forced, at least somehow, I got into that big place, maybe a thousand people. We put the beds close to each other. There was no place where to walk, just to lay down on the bed. There was a lot of people who didn't have any place anymore. I remember that day there were toilets there and they cleaned it out and they lived in that toilets. And that's the truth. And then a lot of people put up like little houses like the Indians have, like tents, but built from wood and they put blankets on top and they got in over there. It was raining and we were swimming um, and they needed barbers. And I am a barber and we got together all the barbers and we put up there our mirrors on the walls and we used to work, cut people's hair when the weather was nice and when it started raining, it was terrible. So first of all, here again, you can see like the, the difference of the situation in Kutno because it was basically for the entire one and a half years of its existence, an open air ghetto and there were only the two buildings that were still intact, but most of the 7,000 people there had to just stay, stay outside. Yes, and so this, these were the photos. Um, when Klasky talks about that, the people tried to establish and build shacks and build a roof over their heads, so there are some, some um, images from the already established ghetto that also show um, a barber stand that they later established. So. I would say, especially here in this case in Kutno, the connection of the photographic sources with the testimonies allows the viewer to look beyond the pictorial frame and give an idea of what happened outside the picture and also afterwards. But mainly, I think what, what working with the testimonies helped me to do was to think about the different qualities of the, the sources. So the photographs, as they're photos by German perpetrators, or at least bystanders, um, are, I would say, in the, in the majority on an aesthetic level documentary. They try to kind of document and capture um, the process. And the interviews, on the other hand, They help um, really um, to refine the context and also give a much better understanding of the concrete situation of the individuals who are subjected to this force moved and also the diversity of the people, of the group, and of their experiences. And at the moment, I'm still really in the, in the process of listening to more interviews, but for now I can say that they have really already helped me to take a much more differentiated look at the situation and also convey a much more complex perspective on the heterogeneous group of people that the photographs tend to homogenize to the viewer. And now I'm open for questions. <laughs> if there are any, yes. I have a question about the barber shop. Um, which did you you knew about the photo first, and then when you arrived, did you specifically search for based on your photos? Did mm -hmm. you search keywords in the VHA? So did you search like like barber shop, and then that testimony came up? Like how did you come across that testimony? That was just accident. I just <laughs> really, I mean, I just looked for ghettoization, ghettoization preparations mainly. And then, yeah, but I didn't look for a barbershop specifically. I wish I had. Are most of the photos in the Holocaust Museum, or are there museums in Germany that have a lot of them? And what made you 
decide to do this particular research, the photos are already there. What are you trying to accomplish in your um, study of them? Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've been, I've looked and found photos like yeah, in small archives in Germany, there are some in the federal archives, then there's of course a lot of, in, of, of them in Polish archives and also in the um, USHMM and Yad Vashem. And so the, this, um, this the photo about the photos of the ghettoization is just one chapter of my dissertation. And the idea was, because we're always facing this, this, this challenge that on the one hand we have a lot of perpetrator photos, and on the other hand we have also very little context. And so I had this 350 photographs and so the idea was to kind of work out the just what I tried to describe, to work out the dominant modes of depiction and to contrast them with images that are more well known or seem more familiar because they have been published more in catalogs and they are more appealing, but actually like the majority of images that I found, they're actually not very um, interesting in a way or aesthetically appealing. It, it, what, what is the purpose of the, your research then if this is just one section? Of the whole thing? How, how does this fit in? I mean, we've seen pictures of, you know, we, we've seen various pictures, so what image and impression should the public be getting out of this? Well, the, like of the whole thing now or of, of the ghettoization? Both. Both. Okay. So here, um, I think for me, the most important point was on the one hand, through the photos to work to show the, pers the dominant perspective, not like of one individual perpetrator, but just when you look at a bunch of photos and then like in a very long process of making series and comparing to work out like the dominant mode. And I think like with that most of the time they, they're they um, taking photos from the people who, who vanish, something like that. And then to add the idea to add the <coughs> The, to add the interviews was that moment when I real when I uh, when I kind of realized that actually um, starting to listening starting to listen to the interviews, I started to really realize like how much also the source shaped my view on the ghettoizations and how much <coughs> how much it really does perpetuate the perpetrator's perspective and how much the interviews actually helped. Um, to really like kind of dive into the picture and actually get to the experiences of the people in the pictures. And generally the, the idea of, um, of uh, my PhD is like I have this large amount of photos and just really to carve out different methods of dealing with these very difficult sources. And I, it would be too much to go into detail of all my single chapters now, but that, that would be the basic idea. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there are so few uh, Germans in the photographs? I noticed in one of the photographs mm -hmm. there is a soldier sort of back up against the wall. But why, why so few it are, I think, are, most of us have a mental image of soldiers sort of chasing the Jews uh, into the ghettos and surrounding them, uh, and you point out that the violence here is 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 it's in the photograph, but it's not the violence that most of us have in our heads mm -hmm. about ghettoization. Why do you think these photographers are not taking pictures of, of soldiers, or weren't there as many soldiers there as we as we think? I. I'm not sure. I think, yeah, it's very, maybe very possible that there were not as many as we think. Um, but I'm, I'm, of course, I also started thinking about if it was, you know, like an intention and they, b but I think it's very hard or 
maybe not a good idea to try to get into the head and try to figure out the intention because yeah. then you kind of get on in this like psychological level which is very <coughs> I think a very difficult position right. so but you don't think that there that there's some I'm thinking of the subjects now you think that, that and I'm, I, I have no idea mm -hmm. but I, th I find the insight about the lack of soldiers so fascinating is it possible that soldiers didn't want their pictures taken? That yes. the people there taking pictures, and, and they're saying, you know, take pictures of the Jews. Don't take. I, I, I don't. I just mm -hmm. wonder about that. Yes, I, I did think about. But I mean, on the other hand, for example, during um, the deportations, in the pic, there are pictures with, yeah, with uniformed people. Yeah. There's also like no act, act, acts of physical violence, but still. So. And, and different, there's a difference probably between a small place like Kutno and a big place like Woj. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's yeah, I mean, in there are a lot of fascinating mysteries. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Kutno, because also because Kutno, I already like I know very well because I have this series of 80 photos, and I actually went there to really try to find like all the spots, the f which like, also in retrospect seems a little bit creepy to have done that, <laughs> and no, but really to just really follow. Yeah. And also, that, but that's really also something that I kind of really just got to me when I was here and really listening to the testimonies, which I also thought. But um, yeah, so in Kutno, it was actually, I mean, the ghetto was um, three kilometers outside the city center. So, and there, there were definitely not like soldiers accompanying the whole thing. But I mean, also in Kutno, there's like no place of registration or nothing like that. It just seems like really complete anarchy. At least there's no documentation. Mm -hmm. You use the phrase, extend the violence into the future. What I have seen from the photos you're showing us is the extension of the lie into the future. Mm -hmm. That is, the lie to the German people that the Jews are simply being relocated, and the lie to the other Jews who might see the photographs and say, relocation isn't that bad will be put to work in the east. We may lose our possessions, but our families are intact, and we go to work someplace else. The mm -hmm. absence of violence is very obvious. This is not a Spielberg movie. No. Right, right, right. <laughs> there is no violence. It is actually continuing to lie into the future for the audiences to see the photos. Yes, but I wouldn't say that contradicts that it, it, the, the violence, the violence the part. Yes, but I mean, uh, I think the violence part that I was talking about was also that it's an act of violence to take a photograph of somebody and that then it becomes a, ma some, a material good that is, we still have that today and they never actually agreed to the photograph being taken nor um, that actually I use it today to show here. And maybe violence is, is, is a strong word, but... Yeah. Could certain Polish people have been complicit and therefore uh, been the leaders uh, pushing the people towards the ghetto rather than the Germans? Yes, but I have no... I have no, like in the photos I don't have, and in the testimonies I didn't come across that. Like what I came across a lot is that the neighbors who took over the apartment or the belongings. Mm -hmm. How did you get interested in this? Was there a photo that really struck you and really inspired you to go down this path? Yeah, I think it was really, uh, the, it's really the one, um, in the very beginning, or this one, like of the ghetto in Kutno, because the situation is just so, um, so extreme. And I mean, also like particularly here. I mean, it's, it's a bit too bright, but you can. It actually seems like this. It never ends. Like all the belongings and the people in between. And I think that was the, the thing that this like, di this mm, displacement of of the. The things that, like an hour or a half a day before, were like part of like a home, and that, like half, like a day later, they're like on 
the grounds of a former abandoned sugar factory and like so many of them and it just seems so mm. I don't, absurd or irritating or I don't even really have a word for it. Have you defined particular towns that you looked at? Particular is it is it limited to a certain number, or is three fifty just what you could find everywhere? For and now, yes. And mm -hmm. is your study about the three fifty, or is it about? Yeah, for now, places? like the, as the work in progress, I've yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, how many photographs were there from Kutno? Did I hear you right when you said eighty? Uh huh. Yes. So, Sounds like there was somebody there, like kind of documenting the whole thing. Do you know what it was? That person was documenting it for. Uh, yes and no. Like that's a case where I actually um, have a bit like more information. So um, yeah. Um, so that was a German Wehrmacht soldier, and he. Um, was a teacher and he was obsessed with taking photos but also like way before like I talked to like he was a teacher at a school and I talked to some of his uh, former students and they always remembered him with a camera and they also remembered that he was somewhat like he was like a loner and a little bit strange like but he was always just there with his camera and um, he took around 400 photographs in Poland and around 80 of them are from Kutno. Um, and it was, s it's kind of interesting, I think it was se like semi-private because he, he did do copies for his fellow soldiers and like also I have some of the lists like where he has like the, the tiny pictures and then he has lists of how many times, how many copies are needed. So some of them were like for a semi, private audience, but mostly he did it just for himself, or at least um, he didn't do anything with the pictures like after the war. He archived them according to his own system that I did not understand, um, but he never published anything, and it's just because um, somebody, uh, the guy who um, cleaned up his house after he died, he just found the pictures and just saved some of them. but. They were never published, and he was not a professional photographer. He was just obsessed with documenting everything around him. But even, I mean, in the case of Kutno, 80 photos are actually, even for him, a lot to take on one day. Mm -hmm. You started to talk about your research process about going to Kutno and marking the spot. Could you talk a little bit more about that process and how the testimony challenged you started to talk a little bit about how watching the testimony challenges that that process or made you reflect on it differently now. Mm -hmm. Is there more you could say about it? Mm -hmm. I th a little bit, I think. I think only when I started really to listen to the testimonies, I only then realized how little I had taken th that into consideration before. I mean, it's not that I didn't take it into consideration at all, but it just makes that much of a difference if you really listen to the testimony and can really relate it to the pictures, at least in your mind. I mean, I didn't find any like direct correlation but, um, yeah, I think it was just this basic mechanism. I have a question for Professor Gruner. <laughs> was it an accident that she found the barber story? No. Why? <laughs> because she, she listened to the testimonies uh, with her information in mind, and so that's why she then was interested in the story. That's my guess. <laughs> well, we were just we were discussing the other day about discovery and uh, what, what and how discovery happens in research. And I think uh, Wolf's point was you don't discover things unless you actually know that you're looking for them. 
And so I was just trying to correlate whether you, mm -hmm. you may not have known you were looking for a barber's mm -hmm. story, but the well, fact you that you sometimes find things you weren't looking for that turn out to be even more interesting than what you were looking for. Because it's relevant to the thing that you already have, the, right. the asset that you have already found and are mm -hmm. examining. Mm -hmm. What was this, the photographer, what was his role as a soldier? Was he supposed to be, was he the soldier that we're not seeing in a way? I mean, are they afraid of him? Are they? Well, he, he was most likely wearing a uniform. Um, but he was part of a Landeschützenregiment. What? <laughs> old, old, old man. Oh, old really? man that didn't have... So he was but mostly guard. for the telephone light men. Mm. He had a civilian task within the mail. Well, yes. Okay. Does your research look at all, this is the kind of the unofficial pho photography, if you will. Does it juxtapose against what the propaganda photos was to look for the differences? Mm-hmm. Um, here, in some of the cases, I have tried to do that. Mm -hmm. Here, not yet. Okay. But generally, like that's that's an idea that's in the mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, since you have some pictures from Lodge, uh, and there is this collection of uh, pictures taken from inmates from Lodge, from the mm -hmm. this um, documentation uh, office, mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the, the color. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, so there is this kind of ambiguity of, uh, about them, that on the one hand they document the effect of perpetration, but they are also perceived as documenting what happened there, and you can even perceive them as an act of a resistance since they document what actually happens. Mm -hmm. Did you came across other like collections of photographs taken from, let's say, Jewish inmates or Jews? And I mean, you mentioned that they're they were taking away the photographs, but was mm -hmm. there a different, kind of a similar case like Lodge, or is this really unique? Mm -hmm. um, just get, just in ghettos and ghettoization. Yeah, whether ghettoization or later on than the life in the ghetto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there, I mean, there are the, um, in Lodge, they also took some secret photos, but I think other than that, no, like what I've come across more is pictures by Polish underground because they were, didn't, were not allowed to um, own the uh, photo labs anymore, but they were still working there and often they, they did like extra copies of some of the pictures they developed for German Wehrmacht soldiers, for example, or they developed their own pictures secretly. And like they took, for example, photos of the um, deportation of Poles. Are there uh, any pictures done by the Polish underground uh, taken by themselves? Because they reported, for example, to London mm -hmm. a lot about what happened uh, in occupied uh, mm -hmm. Poland. Uh, were there any photographs taken? Or is it just written reports to London? Um, I know that there were, I don't know if they took the photos. I just know about this practice that they did like extra copies oh. of photos. Mm -hmm. Have these pictures been shown to any survivors to try and identify families or who's in them? Uh, and how long did they stay in these ghettos like Kutno before? And then I guess their belongings just were taken by non Jews? Um, from, um, I, th in, I think in Kutno, uh, it was about a year and a half until they were deported. And um, I think by then, the belongings that, they, that were there, because they were outside all the time, it was winter, it was raining, and the conditions were horrible, there was not really a lot of, valu were not a lot of valuable things left after the deportations. Some of the things they left in, uh, in their apartments, but... Um, I think this, the things that they took to the ghetto. And were there any survivors who ever looked at these pictures to see if they found family? Not that I know. It's in the, the, these photos are in the Jewish Museum in Rendsburg in the north of Germany. And they've only been there for a couple of years and they haven't really done anything with it as far as I know.
No, I was just, uh, I'm surprised because I didn't know that there were outside ghettos. I had no idea they were completely outside. Was this one of many or were there just a few? Mm, I think I found pictures of case, but I think this was an exception. I mean, most of the time the ghettos were a either a little ones. bit outside the city or, but most of the time they were like within the city and like a neighborhood. But this is also a uh, kind of an effect or result of newer research because recently we have much more research on ghettos uh, done by the Holocaust Museum and uh, this kind of changes and complicates the picture much uh, uh, at, at a scale we never imagined. First of all, the number of ghettos, second of all, the diverse forms of ghettos. So this uh, may not even be an exception. For example, I just found recently uh, for Bohemia and Moravia where we never knew that there were actually ghettos except terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that there were actually a lot of ghettos. It, at the same time in uh, spring, summer 1940s, and also they used factories, for example. So they used all exactly the same like in Kutno they did in, in Bohemia and Moravia. So we are just starting oh, so to involved. Yeah. So we just mm -hmm. starting to know better about all these different and diverse forms. But it's not that we, our picture is so Warsaw driven or large where this is this kind of vault in ghetto, but the majority were not, were not with fences, they were open some t in kind of facilities which had no apartments and so on. Very diverse picture. No. Any more questions? So uh, then I th uh, thank uh, Julia for this incredible <laughs>